We are inside the Abbey for the most solemn and dramatic pictures that have ever appeared on the screen. The ceremony that has remained unchanged for a thousand years. Inside the west door, the members of the royal family take their places. The Princesses Elizabeth and Margaret Rose with the Princess Royal. The procession of Her Majesty the Queen moves up the nave to be greeted after the anthem by the scholars of Westminster School with the Vivat Regina. Procession of His Majesty the King. His Majesty is greeted by the Westminster Scholars with the Vivat Rex. Archbishop of Canterbury asks all those present whether they recognize their king. They cry out, God save King George. I here present unto you King George, your undoubted king. Work for all you who have come this day to do your homage and service. Are you willing to do the same? Three times more, the Archbishop repeats the question until he has faced in turn the four points of the compass. Thus, the 8,000 people inside the Abbey first acclaim their sovereign. Then His Majesty will go to the chair of a state to take the coronation oath. Meanwhile, the regalia, which have been carried by the lords in the procession, are placed by the Dean of Westminster upon the altar. The King prepares to take the oath. The Archbishop asks him if he will solemnly promise to govern and the people of Great Britain, Ireland, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the Union of South Africa, of your possessions and the other territories to any of them belonging or pertaining 
and of your empire of India according to their respective laws and customs? I solemnly promise so to do. Will you to your power cause law and justice in mercy to be executed in all your judgments? I will. Still sitting in the chair of estate, the king signs the oath. Twice he dips his pen in the ink. Now he will disrobe for the most sacred part of the service, the anointing with holy oil. The Knights of the Garter will bring the canopy of cloth of gold. Be thy breast anointed with holy oil. Be thy head anointed with holy oil. After the anointing, the secular and sacred characters of the coronation merge. The super tunica, or overdress of cloth of gold, is put upon the king. A girdle of the same material is caught around his waist. The Lord Chamberlain touches his heels with the golden spurs of knighthood. From the altar, the Archbishop brings the jeweled sword of state. Thus is symbolized in the king the merging of the temporal and divine power. Receive this kingly sword brought now from the altar of God and delivered to you by the hands of us, the bishops and servants of God, though unworthy. The sword is girt about the king by the Lord Great Chamberlain. Let this sword do justice, stop the growth of iniquity, protect the holy church of God, help and defend widows and orphans, and so faithfully serve our Lord Jesus Christ in this life, that you may reign forever with him in the life which is to come. The king ungirds the sword, and going towards the altar, offers it in the scabbard to the Archbishop. The peer who first received the sword redeems it for the price of 100 shillings and during the remainder of the service he carries it naked before the king. The armil or collar is placed on the king by the Dean of Westminster. The dean invests him with a mantle of cloth of gold, shaped square like the cope of a bishop, and richly adorned with the eagle of empire. His Majesty takes the orb with a cross. Receive this imperial robe and orb, and the Lord your God endure you with knowledge and wisdom, with majesty and with power from on high. The Sovereign receives the ring, a great sapphire slashed with a cross of rubies. The Lord of the Manor of Worksop presents the glove. His Majesty takes the scepter with a cross, the symbol of his earthly power, and the scepter with a dove, the symbol of divine guidance.
Now every eye is riveted on the St. Edward's crown as the Archbishop of Canterbury lifts it from the altar and the Dean of Westminster bears it to where the King sits in the coronation chair. The Archbishop of Canterbury takes it, raises it with solemnity, lowers it on the royal brow. The King is crowned. The peers acclaim their sovereign. austere coronation chair to take his golden throne for the homage. All the great officers of state group in dazzling array around the sovereign. In their majestic sweeping robes, peers of the realm will pay homage one by one at the feet of King George VI, then rise one by one to touch his majesty's crown and kiss his left cheek. First the Archbishop, then the Duke of Gloucester, the Duke of Kent and the Earl Marshal, the Duke of Norfolk. Since the beginning of the service, Her Majesty the Queen has been sitting in the chair of estate. Now she moves forward for her anointing. Four peeresses bring the golden canopy. The Queen kneels at the altar. The Archbishop will pour the holy oil upon the crown of her head. He will put the Queen's ring upon the fourth finger of her right hand. The Archbishop brings the crown from the altar, sets it upon the Queen's head. Receive the crown of glory, honor and joy. The Archbishop puts the scepter into her right hand, the ivory rod with a dove into her left. The Queen moves across to pay homage to the King. Her train is borne by the Mistress of the Robes and the ladies in waiting. After the Queen and her ladies have bowed in homage, her Majesty will take her place on the throne. Then the King and Queen will move forward towards the altar and enter St. Edward's Chapel, where the King will exchange the St. Edward's crown for the Imperial State crown, which he will wear on the state drive back to Buckingham Palace.
Thus consecrated and crowned, their majesties walk in procession through the nave and choir to leave the abbey. The coronation is over. <laughs>